thank, thank you very much, uh, Antoine. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure, of course, for me to be here. Um, I, I've known Antoine for quite some time. I was on, he, he was reminding me earlier that the jury for his PhD defence, um, some time ago, clearly, and we've also co-authored papers together. Uh, now, I, I, it's a great pleasure to take part in this course. I know that the focus is economics and political economy, so you may be wondering why a law professor is standing here in front of you. Well, sure. Um, when I did, I did my PhD um, in the University of Cambridge in the 1980s, um, I was co-supervised by uh, a law professor and by an economist, uh, Frank Wilkinson, and I guess I come from the, the Cambridge School in that sense, the Cambridge Economics School, Heterodox Economics, Political Economy. I'm also interested in, in the economics of law, and I did spend a year at Chicago Law School as well in the mid-1980s, so I saw both sides of that debate. But when I came back from Chicago, I had not been converted into a Chicago School economist, I guess that, that was clear. An interesting experience, though. Uh, I teach law and economics at Cambridge, um, and I teach a course which may be a little bit like this one, an interdisciplinary course with a focus on political economy, although most of the time I am uh, speaking to lawyers, and I know that's not the case today, I'm speaking to social scientists. So what I want to do is to put law into a political economy context, and I won't say too much today about the detail of labour law, I want to look at wider trends in the economy relating to the labour market, and to some degree the capital market, and I want to link those trends to inequality trends. Uh, and I want to see what the relationship is between the institutional framework for labour on the one hand and capital on the other and wider equality and inequality trends in um, economies, not just in the global north, but more generally. So I will be discussing the literature on um, inequality, uh, Piketty and Palmer, and linking that to work I and others have done, which attempts to well, let's say benchmark or measure trends in um, legal regulation. How protective is labour law of workers' rights and how protective is company law of shareholder rights? My um, hypothesis here, my working hypothesis, is that the way the legal system protects the claims of different stakeholders inside the firm, workers, investors, creditors, has implications obviously for productive efficiency but also for um, distribution and equality. And it's not difficult to see that in principle when labour laws get stronger we should expect to see a higher rate of return to labour and we do more or less see that but equally when shareholder rights are strengthened are we going to see a higher rate of return to capital? Well broadly speaking yes and over the past 20 to 30 years there have been major changes in labour law and company law associated with especially in company law the rise of the shareholder value uh, approach within corporate governance, prioritising the investor interest. That's led to major changes in the way firms are run. Uh, takeover bids became more common, beginning in America and Britain in the 1980s. Less so in France and in so-called coordinated market economies, but still a trend. So the big change in law has been, and I'll explore this in a minute in more detail, company law becoming much more protective of shareholder rights while labour law has not necessarily become less protective on the whole of worker rights, but relatively speaking, there's been a greater stress on shareholder protection. And I, I think this role of law in shaping returns to labour and capital has been a little bit underestimated in, in much of the inequality literature, and I want to develop that theme as I go along. So I'm going to talk about the dynamics of... Uh, now, I see this already hasn't worked. OK, so I think I'm doing something wrong. I just tried to push the slide on. So am I in the wrong document? Yeah, it hasn't, it hasn't moved up here, has it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I think... Yeah. We had this... Did you turn this? It didn't move on the, no. on, on the screen, did it? Yeah. Okay, so we need to be in a different document. Like this. Okay, this one. I'll try this. No, 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 hang no, on. No, it didn't work. Yeah. The Is it this one? No, it doesn't work. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> It's got to be this one. Let me try this one. Oh, that's it, yeah. Okay, I'm really sorry about that high-tech stuff. I'm only a lawyer, right, okay. Yeah, I, th I, think it, I think it's working now. Okay, thanks. Uh, I've also got to admit people on Zoom. Okay, I'm, I'm multitasking here, right, okay. So, I want to talk about the dynamics of wealth and income over the long run, uh, discussing Piketty and other 
claims, the Kuznets curve, and then say something about uh, Gabriel Palmer's work on inequality, and then look more specifically at how changes in labour and company law might be feeding into uh, inequality trends, and then to discuss where we go from here and whether it's possible to use changes to legal institutions to do something about the um, inequality trends which we, we have been observing over the past 20 or 30 years and a very great increase in both income and wealth inequality which is a common feature of virtually every economy um, in, in the world and to varying degrees. So let me begin by saying something about um, theories about inequality and capitalism, structural transformation theory, uh, Kuznets and Lewis. This maybe was the optimistic view of the 1950s and 1960s that capitalism uh, over the long run should produce greater equality. Inequality ought to go down. Um, and this is associated with the notion of the, of the Kuznets curve here. Um, the idea that in the early stages of industrialization there is an increase in income inequality which eventually is reversed. And this was the trend um, observed statistically by Simon Kuznets in the 1950s, although his studies only really covered a very small number of countries. However, these were some of the, the larger uh, liberal democracies at that point, the United States, France, Germany, also Sweden, were in his original data set. So he observed that in the early stages of industrialization, uh, there's an increase in income inequality, Pre-industrial societies are, in a sense, more equal than early industrial societies because nearly everybody, by modern standards, would be poor. That was Kuznets' idea. You would have a kind of caste right at the top, the monarchy, maybe priests, a few other noble, noble people, but the vast majority of people are equal with each other and mean relatively poor. Industrialization creates a bourgeois class, and this middle class pulls away from uh, a working class or proletariat. And so uh, early industrialization in Western Europe, in North America, produces rising inequality. So inequality is going up as economic development begins. But after a certain point, identified as the middle of the 20th century in Kuznets' original data set, this, this trend is reversed. So equality uh, improves. Inequality goes down. Now, of course, since 1970, this is... Piketty's bit of the curve, uh, inequality begins to go back up again from 1970 or so onwards. So we now know what Kuznets uh, didn't really know, couldn't have known, which is that the reversal of inequality trends isn't permanent within capitalism. So it can't be a fundamental feature of capitalism. Something else is going on. There may be particular phases within capitalism, but capitalism doesn't necessarily produce over time uh, greater equality. We know that. Why would equality, however, have increased in the middle of the 20th century in the global north at any rate? Arthur Lewis and also to some degree Kuznets are both arguing that there's an internal dynamic um, within capitalism. Um, it produces a working class and after a certain period of time that class has the possibility of achieving power, uh, maybe through the ballot box. Okay, so... Capitalism leads to industrialization, uh, the growth of a wage-earning class at some point. If the political conditions are right, then that wage-earning class can, through the institutions of liberal parliamentary democracy, press for the things that will protect it, labor law being one of them. Laws protecting the right to collective bargaining and freedom of association. Laws protecting the right to strike. Health and safety laws. A social insurance system which protects workers against risks inherent to wage dependence, risks of unemployment, risks of ill health, industrial injury and disease. This is what labour law basically does. It manages risks which are inherent in the labour market status of being wage dependent, of having no direct access to the means of production in a capitalist society that describes nearly everybody. Right. So in the middle of the 20th century, certainly, Practically everybody in a capitalist market economy is wage dependent to some degree. There might be a rentier class that lives purely on income from shares or from some other sort of rent. But by the middle of the 20th century, this is quite a small group and many of them are also working. Yes, of course, there are people like, okay, the latter-day monarchs, right, the Queen of England, now we have a king, of course. 
or Emperor Franz Joseph of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, who famously described himself as a self-employed civil servant. Right. Even the monarchy worked right, um, at the high point of this model, or maybe a bit before in the case of Franz Joseph. So nearly everybody is dependent on wages to some degree. Everybody is excluded to that extent from the means of production which are institutionally held. Okay. There may be individual capitalists, but shareholders from the middle of the 20th century are institutions, by and large, not families. J.K. Galbraith made this point in his various works. From the middle of the 20th century onwards, it's no longer the individual or the family that's really the shareholder, but the investment fund, the pension fund, and in some cases, uh, state institutions as well. Everything is institutionalised and collectivised. Uh, the main beneficiaries of corporate governance, in a sense, would be pensioners, uh, beneficiaries of pension funds and owners of investments in mutual funds, savings and insurance, who are also workers or have retired from the labour market. So this is a mid-20th mid century picture that wage dependence creates a working class, which is quite large in some respects, and creates, you might say, a common interest across this class, both a middle class, a bourgeoisie, and a pure wage earning class, have a common interest in the institutions of the welfare state, social insurance, collective bargaining, uh, we have middle-class trade unions, white-collar trade unions, and this puts pressure upon governments to enact laws to uh, protect workers' rights, and, and that's how we get labour law. And over time, there's a compression of the income scale and also, eventually, some redistribution of wealth at the level of assets. Distinguishing between income and wealth is, of course, important, and we tend to have rather more data on income than we do on wealth, although Piketty's key contribution, as I see it, is to have looked at wealth and assets and not just at income. That was important. Am I going at the right speed for everybody? Yes? Is this more or less OK? OK. And I will carry on until uh, either you stop me or I get to the end. But I'm not quite sure what your convention is. If you have questions, maybe we can deal with them as we go along. Uh, or if there are no questions, I'll just carry on. Yeah? I know we have time for discussion later as well. So this is structural transformation theory. It's endogenous to capitalism. Capitalism produces a working class. There are institutions of liberal democracy. They begin by protecting property rights, sure, uh, the rights of a bourgeois class, but eventually they can confer rights upon everybody and you, you get some kind of wage earner, wage earner democracy, a phrase used actually about Germany, West Germany, in the middle of the 20th century. A wage earner democracy, that's what you get. So this is a, a, a process which is somehow endogenous to capitalist development, and Kuznets thought it was more or less permanent. So capitalism produces more equality over time, and a liberal democracy can be conjoined to the welfare state, but you still have capitalism. Okay. So in some ways, this is a, an optimistic story for maybe a more optimistic period than our own. Sure, this was in France the period of uh, what, les trente glorieuses, um, or in other contexts, a so-called golden age between about 1950 and 1980 of continuous improvements in economic growth, productivity, in certain parts anyway of the global north, France, Germany, the US, the UK, all experienced this period of relative stability. Now, um, Piketty, and others were already observing, uh, even before the publication of Piketty's two main books, that this, this trend went into reverse at some point. Um, and it appears that there, there was a major shift in many countries round about um, 1970 and 1980. So inequality trends began to reverse in America round about 1970, and a little bit later in other countries. You can see here 1970 is a turning point in the United States, 1980 in Europe, uh, and Japan, again, really, it's more 1980. But something is going on in uh, these advanced so-called industrial economies round about, round about this time. So Piketty and his co-authors, Saez and others, chart this shift. The equality trend begins, as you can see, round about 1913, or even more so just after the First World War. So from the early 20th century onwards, you get reductions in inequality, um, and this goes into reverse from about 1970, 1980 onwards. And we see uh, a shift in income shares, so that the share of income taken by the top 1%, but even more so, not quite on this chart, but it's a point, top 0.01%, and the top 0.01%, their share goes exponentially up since about 1980, and the share here 
of the bottom 50%, this is striking, isn't it? The bottom 50%, uh, at some point, there's a crossover with the top 1%. Okay, so you see this steepening inequality and division uh, within large industrial societies. This is the um, United States only, but that's, that's, that's quite characteristic. And it's not just in the, uh, the global north. There are other countries where this inequality trend can also be observed. We see it in China, in particular from the late 1990s. Um, and we also see it in India. And indeed, we see it in many middle-income countries. Now, many middle-income countries are more unequal at the moment, to this day, than uh, high-income countries. But we see inequality increasing almost everywhere. So it's a global phenomenon and not simply one associated with um, the United States. And then you get this so-called, yes? You say it's a global phenomenon, but I can't find, find African countries. There are some African countries I'm going to come to in a minute. They're not on that particular chart, but it's very, it's very evident in South Africa. I know that's not necessarily a typical case, but there is, there is a, a trend in African countries too. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry for the interruption. No problem, yeah. I also want to ask, is there an intrinsic reason for the reversal of the equality? Is there a, a universal Is there a statistic reason for the reversal of equality? Because you showed a graph where it's all you are coming to that. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to come to explanations in a minute, or at least try to offer some. I mean, I, I think there are different explanations in different countries and different degrees of inequality in, in, in different countries. That, that's absolutely the case. So it's not necessarily the same uh, set of factors that's leading to an increase in inequality. But I think all countries are affected, to, to answer your question more directly, okay, all countries are affected by globalisation and all countries are affected by neoliberal policies um, but there is a, a distinct pattern in the uh, middle income countries compared to the um, earlier industrialising countries which this so-called um, elephant curve um, reveals. This may be partly to answer your question that um, what we see in the wealthier countries um, okay, this is US and Western Europe, the countries which enjoyed the 30 glorious years of economic growth. Um, what we see is this so-called squeezed bottom 90%. So globalisation and the... Well, this is from uh, Piketty and Milanovic, this kind of elephant curve that you see. Um, what we see, thanks to globalisation, is the rise everywhere of a middle class. And this middle class means that in so-called emerging economies, middle-income countries, we actually see um, an increase in income levels in real terms, but is going down in Western Europe. And this is partly the consequence, again, of this is globalisation. So globalisation producing economic growth in middle-income countries and also in low-income countries, but it's mainly a middle-income country phenomenon. This leads to a global redistribution of wealth in favour of middle income countries and in favour of the global south. Right. So in, in that particular context, the rise of the middle class uh, is seen in, in very positive terms. However, in many of these countries, South Africa, almost everywhere in South America, even though you see the middle class growing, you also see uh, wealth inequalities and income inequalities growing because there's a segment of very, very high earners and very, very wealthy households right at the top in middle-income countries. So you see a big middle class growing in the um, non-European, non-North American world, but in Europe and North America, we see a relative decline. And this may help to explain part of the political fallout in Western Europe and North America, the reaction to the loss of security, loss of stability, and, and relative privilege of the middle class in Europe and North America. I think we can see in, in Trump, in Brexit, in some of the political <coughs> fallout from that, but this is not true of middle income countries in the same sense. In the middle income countries a different dynamic, growing middle class and increasing prosperity and wealth, but this very high uh, inequality, this stratospheric inequality, the top 1% and 0.1% and 0.001%, this is everywhere. Right, so in America, in Brazil, in South Africa, in all these countries, you get exponentially increasing in incomes right at the top. But I think politically, maybe it's a different phenomenon in a country like 
Brazil or South Africa to the phenomenon we observe in a country like France or Germany or the UK, where I think there's a, a clearer backlash from a middle class that sees its position deteriorating. So it's not exactly the same picture. And again, this wouldn't apply to all African countries. Not all African countries are at the same level of industrialization or development, for example, as South Africa is or Nigeria is. So it's, it's a different situation. Some are low-income countries, which are not significantly growing at all. Okay, does that help to address your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, so this, this is what we see. Globalization, um, and globalization implies a number of things. Um, obviously, uh, opening up of trade and um, competition for both labour and capital on a global scale. Also, to some degree, a race to the bottom in regulatory standards. So, globalisation is very much on the terms initially set out by the World Trade Organisation, and labour laws and regulations are seen as a distortion of competition and potentially um, hindering uh, trade, it's so called non tariff barriers to trade. So globalisation doesn't, uh, doesn't just produce a certain type of competition, it's also affecting standards in labour markets in particular. The International Labour Organisation, which has the role of setting international labour standards, is very much marginalised in this period, and the World Trade Organisation is to the fore. And the WTO's argument is that labour standards, international labour standards, are a barrier to trade, and it's growth which will produce um, labour uh, protection over time, not standards as such. So globalisation has a political and a legal dimension, and not just, it's not just the, the removal of barriers to competition, it's a particular philosophy, a particular approach to governing the economy, which essentially says um, a rising tide lifts all boats. Okay, so the basic idea is, okay, I, Jack, Jack Kennedy said that, John F. Kennedy said a rising tide lifts all boats, but this would be the philosophy of our current British Prime Minister, Liz Truss, for sure, and I expect she'll say it any day now. Um, as, as of two weeks ago, of course, you will have seen that economic policy in the UK radically changed and we now want growth, growth, growth. But trust is explicit that more inequality will produce growth. And in a way, this is the World Trade Organization's uh, own approach for the past uh, few decades. Although, at the moment, it's worth remembering that there hasn't been a new multilateral WTO treaty for quite some time. And the WTO is perhaps being eclipsed a bit at the moment by the ILO, and labour standards may be making a comeback. But maybe more of that later. So far, so good. This is the basic story about inequality. It's been growing since the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, what's driving it? Partly globalisation. Um, that has led to some, to some extent a narrowing of the gap between uh, the middle income or global south world and the global north world. But in every country, uh, rising, uh, rising inequality. I mean, again, just to think about China, for example. In China's case, um, the growth of a middle class and the ending of extreme poverty okay, in China has brought tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. And this has led to a fall in the global uh, Gini coefficient, according to some people. Right? So the, the global Gini, the global inequality measure, has been going down since about 2011, just because hundreds of millions of people in China have been taken out of extreme poverty, so there's been a narrowing of the gap. But within China itself, the Gini hasn't gone down. Because within China itself, there is such extreme inequality, right at the top, that China's own national Gini is still going up. So there are some paradoxical effects here. It's not quite true to say that the global Gini is still going up. This, of course, could, could be reversed in time as well, because it's almost like a one-off effect. You take hundreds of millions of people out of poverty in one country, <coughs> that's what China achieved. I expect the global Gini to start going back up again, unless there are institutional changes at a global level of, of some sort. Now, Piketty's um, explanation for this, um, you, you, you probably know, is that it's all to do with growth, um, and that he argued that capitalism it's the opposite of Kuznets' claim. Capitalism has a fundamental dynamic which produces inequality, and this is to do with his argument about the relationship between capital returns and labour returns. And he argues at some length in his first book, Capital in the 21st Century, that cap returns to capital have a natural tendency to increase over time um, as long as a market economy or a capitalist economy is stable. Right. And he says the only way you'll avoid this perpetual increase in inequality is, well, one solution would be more growth, 
Right, so he says growth tends to increase returns to labour compared to capital. So a period of slow growth, he argued, is a period of increasing inequality because of this dynamic. Um, these are some of his claims. Slow growth produces inequality, but also um, wealth can be destroyed. So Piketty's explanation for the fall in inequality from about the second decade of the 20th century is that the two world wars and the Great Depression between them destroyed a lot of wealth. Right? And that produced greater um, equality. Right? So that's a very pessimistic um, view, or a realistic one, depending upon your understanding of capitalism, which is that you've got to really destroy a lot of wealth through war or depression to achieve uh, greater equality within capitalism. This is Piketty's claim. At least the claim in his first book, I think he somewhat modified this in his um, later book. Now, a bit more detail, though. Uh, the um, Chilean and Cambridge economist Gabriel Palmer has written very interestingly about inequality. So he goes into slightly more detail about the structure of inequality in particular countries. And Gabriel has argued, and I think probably empirically shown, that there's limited evidence for the Kuznets curve, at least for the idea that you've got to have inequality before you get to equality. Right? So Gabriel has shown that there's not much evidence for the first phase of the Kuznets curve in many countries. And he's, he's trying to argue here that you don't need to go through a phase of radical um, inequality before you get to an equality, equality stage. And he's shown that in many countries, there's what he calls this homogenous middle. There's a middle class of about 50 to 60% of the population, he argues, in both mi many middle-income countries in the global south and also the early industrialisers of the global north. And Gabriel argues that it's actually not the middle class that counts here, it's the relationship between the top 10% and the bottom 40% or so that is driving overall inequality trends. So he wants us to focus on the people right at the top, how far ahead are they of the middle class, and a large body of what he calls the working class, uh, people who are wage dependent, but may be employed in precarious work, in the informal economy, do not have, do not have regular access to an employment contract perhaps, um, do not have a pension, do not have that type of income security or insurance-based security. Uh, where does that bottom 40 or 50% stand in relation to the other two groups? So the Palmer ratio is this ratio of the income share, the top 10% to the bottom 40%. Um, and some of Gabriel's figures, I think, are quite, quite interesting. Um, and what you can see from this, this is just Gini, this is Gini coefficients again, but you see there are some countries which are extremely unequal and some which are less so. So it is the case that a country like France, okay, most EU countries are uh, less unequal um, than countries uh, we might describe as middle-income countries. Okay, right at the top, we see countries like Brazil, but also Hong Kong and China and India and also South Africa. So South America is uh, a region characterised by extreme inequality, by and large. And so is South Africa itself. Um, despite the end of apartheid, uh, South Africa has remained an extremely unequal country. And in fact, inequality in South Africa has got worse after the end of apartheid. Now, that, that is for various reasons. Firstly, um, there's been no fundamental land reform in South Africa. Right? Uh, so there has been a shift in political institutions, but not yet in social institutions. There has been an attempt to build a large black uh, middle class but that has only gone so far. But also, remember, when apartheid ended in South Africa, that's the very moment at which South Africa re-enters the world economy. It had been isolated for the previous uh, few decades at the very moment when globalisation is really developing quickly. So South Africa re-enters uh, the global economy at a point where neoliberal policies are the norm, where the World Trade Organisation is pressuring middle-income countries to accept what would now appear to be, I think, very uneven deals in bilateral trade agreements. Um, South Africa suddenly finds that its industries in areas like textiles and clothing, which had been successful, are being undercut by even more competitive or at least low-wage economies in the Southern Africa region. 
consistently with World Trade Organization philosophy, South Africa creates an internal market in sub-Saharan Africa, in the southern part of Africa, and immediately capital leaves South Africa and goes to Lesotho and Swaziland and Mozambique, where wages are even lower, and there's actually deindustrialization in South Africa. So a number of things are driving South Africa's extreme um, inequality performance. Uh, again, if we look at countries in South America, uh, Brazil, uh, Argentina, to a certain degree, uh, Chile, other countries, we see the top 10% taking a very significant share of national income. So it's this, uh, this system in South America which appears to be able to preserve the extreme inequality between a rather small elite right at the top and everybody else, which is striking about the South American model and the South African one too, which we don't observe in Western Europe or even in the United States to anything like the same, the same degree. So Gabriel has this interesting chart about Finland and Uruguay, and he points out that the, uh, the, the middle class um, is approximately the same size, or the share of what he calls a middle and upper middle in Uruguay is the same as in Finland. But the reason Uruguay is not as e egalitarian as Finland is this D10 section, people right at the top. There's a bigger group of people right at the top of society in Uruguay taking a larger share of income, and this this pulls the uh, income scale up um, and leads to the overall conclusion that there's a higher genie in Uruguay than there is in Finland, 40 versus 27. And the Palmer ratio is also larger in Uruguay than it is in Finland. So it's what's going on right at the top, he says, in South America, which explains these inequalities. And there are various reasons for this which he discusses, which may be specific to the way in which the South American economies have evolved over time. Uruguay um, is an interesting case, though, and I mention it partly because I've just been there, okay, so I've been doing some research and lecturing in Uruguay. Uruguay is the most egalitarian South American country by quite a long way, um, and also, interestingly, has the strongest labour laws of any South American country, more or less. I know it's difficult to measure these things, but that's what I've been doing, producing a benchmark of the strength or weakness of labour law protection. Uruguay has strong labour laws and very strong institutions, one trade union, federation that represents everybody, more or less, um, a tradition of um, strong sector-level collective bargaining, so firms can't escape collective agreements by just disaffiliating from uh, a trade union federation. Now, of course, also, Uruguay is a very small country, so maybe this is possible in smaller, homogenous countries, which Uruguay undoubtedly is, by comparison to Brazil and even to Argentina. So smaller countries, okay, Sweden, Uruguay, Finland, okay, may be able to achieve um, a high degree of equality. Um, perhaps the political factors are more conducive in such a context, it's not altogether clear. But getting down to the nitty gritty of institutions, strong trade unions, strong collective bargaining, um, these are not things of the past, these still exist in many countries. Laws which extend collective agreements so firms can't escape uh, the sectoral wage, strong minimum wages, uh, Uruguay is an example of this. So it's not impossible to have a higher degree of equality in a South American context. And I think we should be really, really cautious about cultural stereotypes connected to particular parts of the world. They seem to me to explain very, very little. Right, okay. There are other more concrete factors which can explain equality trends. And we see within regions, highly equal countries, Uruguay would be one, very unequal countries, sure. Brazil, Argentina, but we also see in Europe today very different degrees of inequality and that's down, I don't think, to culture but to particular institutions and to the way they work. In the United Kingdom, for example, we don't see strong trade unions, we don't see strong sector level collective bargaining and we have a very weak welfare state. Um, most EU member states don't have that model and that's nothing to do with culture, that's just to do with politics. If you go back 40 or 50 years ago in the UK, it actually had very strong labour market institutions. Um, so I think institutions do matter and politics matters. I don't think these countries are bound in by, by, by very broad brush factors like, like culture. That doesn't seem to me to be a convincing explanation, but we can look at that later. So far, so good. Any questions or comments before I go on? I'll just pause for breath. Now, uh, what else may be driving it? Again, to be, to be precise, globalisation legally um, produces a situation in which it's not just that capital moves across borders, it, it does of course do that, 
and workers move to a lesser degree. Right? So capital <coughs> inherently is more mobile than labour. And capital has become mobile thanks to changes in technology to some extent. No matter how much migration we see, we do see a lot more than we used to. Labour is never going to be as mobile as capital. But we also see some other features of globalisation which are really nothing at all to do with capital flows, or at least with uh, anything really moving. But we see jurisdictional and legal changes which can benefit capital without the capital even shifting. Okay, so your, your capital, um, however we wish to define it, okay, whether we talk about productive assets, whether we talk about money or finance, maybe doesn't even need to move in any real physical sense, but can take advantage of low-cost jurisdictions, thanks to the technique lawyers call private international law or conflict of laws, the legal jurisdiction governing the management of capital can be quite other than the physical place in which plant is located, or for that matter, in which a particular bank deposit is held. So tax arbitrage, regulatory arbitrage, tax evasion, tax avoidance, a whole industry has grown up around this, uh, employing many, many thousands or tens of thousands of lawyers. And occasionally we see uh, in the press something like the Panama Papers uh, will reveal uh, something about tax avoidance and tax evasion. The sheer scale of it, though, um, is, is extraordinary. And it has been increasing as a consequence of globalisation, or is one feature of globalisation that I think we're beginning to understand more of. So Gabriel Zuckman, uh, along with Piketty and Saez and others working as part of this group, have been looking at the extent to which financial wealth is hidden in contemporary capitalism, holding wealth offshore, uh, concealing it from regulatory authorities so it's beyond the scope of taxation. Interestingly, he says, not much in the United States. Now, we might think of the United States as an unequal society by comparison to many in the EU, but America has a very effective fiscal regime, which may be why this figure of 4% here is so low. 4% held uh, abroad, 10% in Europe, higher. 22% of wealth is held offshore, he says, in Latin American countries, even higher in Africa, 30%, extraordinarily high, in the Gulf and in Russia. Right, so wealth is being held offshore and that requires a legal system to engineer this, to hide the wealth, to conceal the wealth, to make sure regulatory authorities can't reach it. And legally, um, the principle of mutual recognition here is very important. It basically means that one legal system may recognise the legal determination made by another. This begins in areas like family law, where there might be mutual recognition of marriages, or company law, where you recognise an incorporation of a company in another state. But increasingly it also means that you, you, you respect the right of another state to assert jurisdictional control over assets, even if those assets are held on your territory. So mutual recognition implies a radical kind of deterritorialization. And when you add to that the sense in which the corporate form has been fissured, people say, or fragmented, parent-subsidiary relationships, often um, in economics, of course, in, in the social sciences, we think of the enterprise or the business firm as a unity, but a lawyer would be accustomed to regarding nearly every enterprise that we observe as actually a multi-corporate enterprise. There are many legal persons, companies with, within a given enterprise, and multinational companies in particular, yeah. Um, aside from offshoring, what about this, this, um, this idea that many of these big companies, especially with greenwashing these days, they'll create non-profits mm. um, yeah. to, to hide the wealth also. Uh, I mean, I'm a little bit skeptical sometimes if like kind of donating or working with a non-profit that's tied to a large company. So um, what do you think about that in this, in this context? Yeah, that, that also goes on. So in, in many countries, if you set up a cooperative um, or even a charity like a non-profit, non there, there are fiscal advantages. But often they are just fronts for commercial companies. That's absolutely right. I, I, I just, I was, when I was doing field work in South Africa in a project involving interviewing in, in factories, uh, at that particular point, um, many factories, okay, which had been initially set up through commercial companies, uh, companies limited by shared capital, were being, were, were being re-established as cooperatives for this very reason. And the owner of a factory I interviewed in, in, in a, a township in Newcastle in South Africa said, well, we just become a cooperative. 
and the workers now own the company. That's right. Uh, but actually, of course, they, they were still under the control of this. He really was an owner, a Taiwanese, in fact, running a, a textile mill in, in, in a South African township. That was a common pattern, too, investment from Taiwan into South Africa. That began in the apartheid period when South Africa and Taiwan were able to trade with each other, but with very few other countries. So that's just one example. You get this use as a cooperative form sometimes to conceal what's really still basically a profit oriented operation. But it's, 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 it's not just that. Okay, take another example. Um, okay, this is a bit of a British parochial example, but you may know about the case of P&O Ferries, which is a ferry company which runs passenger ferries between, for example, Dover and Calais, uh, and more generally around the British Isles. A few months ago, P&O dismissed, okay, 4,000 or so workers, uh, sorry, not, not, not quite that many, around about 1,000, dismissed at short notice the crew of the ferries, <coughs> right. And now, under UK labour law, that's a collective redundancy, and this is true of other EU countries. You can't just dismiss hundreds of workers. Um, there are meant to be notification requirements. You're meant to inform and consult the workers through their trade unions. Now, it's a criminal offence not to notify the government of a collective redundancy. The UK has laws to this effect. So it would appear that the company committed a crime, and although it's, it's not sanctionable by imprisonment, there's an unlimited fine for breach of this uh, provision of UK labour law. Quite unusual. So the directors could be charged with a, a, a criminal offence, and so could the company. Now, what it, what it then transpired that the ships were all registered under Cypriot law. And then secondly, it further transpired that a cross-channel ferry isn't really operating in British territory, right, because the open sea isn't part of the UK. Okay. Further, it transpires the minimum wage law doesn't apply, therefore, once the ship leaves port, which for all intents and purposes means it doesn't apply. And the reflagging of the ship had been actively encouraged by a statutory change two or three years earlier, which had been a further consequence of European court, EU court rulings, to the effect that employers, or in this case comp shipping companies, had the absolute right to reflag a ship under any EU jurisdiction, even if it meant they were doing it to avoid regulation. Because to say otherwise would be an interference with the internal market. Again, the WTO logic that labour laws are a non-tariff barrier to trade. Within the EU, the internal market principle, you can reflag your British ships into... Cypriot law, no problem. Yeah. Oh, sorry, is that one of the consequences of the Viking case? Yes, absolutely right. This is, this lawyers will know, and you, you may all know, I don't know, the Viking case. This is a case where a ship was reflagged from Finnish to Estonian law, and the workers suddenly found they might not have any rights under the Finnish collective agreement. They then went on strike, and the European Court basically said the strike was an interference with the operation of the internal market. Cutting, cutting a long story short, of course. Yeah, so this is a consequence of the Viking case. The Collective Redundancies Directive was amended and the UK passed a law in 2019 to permit the reflagging. Now, it then further transpires that the company um, seems British, P&O Ferries, established in 1820, in fact is now owned by a Dubai consortium. Right. And here, again, corporate law comes into play. The key decision maker is the ruler of Dubai. He is the main shareholder in a holding company which owns P&O Ferries. But any criminal offence committed by the company, remember, would not be committed by the shareholder. So he's absolutely secure, even though most likely the Dubai owners were taking these decisions to dismiss several hundred workers. Why did they dismiss them? In order, the next day, to employ agency staff on a fraction of the wage. So they had been observing a UK collective agreement. Um, under UK law, a collective agreement is not a legally binding contract. You can get out of it by, in this case, dismissing the workers, which is what they did. They employ agency workers on a fraction of the wage formally being paid. They are employed via a Jersey registered company. OK, the Channel Islands are, in one sense, part of the UK, but in another sense, not. Right, they're separate legal jurisdictions, again, not falling under UK labour law. Now, that example is just one, one case we could we could think about where you see legal fishering of the enterprise, not just parent-subsidiary relationships, but different jurisdictions applying to work done, not even on, well, even in UK territory, okay, it might not be UK law governing the situation, but as soon as the ship leaves the port, it's not clear, 
and the government actively, I think, encouraging this process. They knew this would happen when the laws were changed in 2019. Now the government says, well, maybe we'll bring a prosecution against the company because they failed to notify the Cypriot government. That was what they said. But then uh, they looked into it and a QC, now senior lawyer, looked into it. So, well, we're not quite clear mm -hmm, that it's a crime to fail to notify the Cypriot authorities. It would have been to fail to notify the British ones. So this is how law works in an era of globalisation. It permits this kind of legal fragmentation and deterritorialization of law. And I think this is partly what's driving the hiding and extracting of wealth. And you might characterise this as a model in which wealth isn't being produced, isn't being created. This is a patholo pathological form of capitalism, I, I would suggest, which is really good at hiding wealth and extracting wealth, but not especially good, I think, at, at creating it. And this is what uh, is revealed, I think, by the research done by Zuckman and others. Uh, but I think it's not just about inequality, it's about a productive model that's really, really failing. Now, um, going into a little bit more detail about inequality in labour shares, Piketty uh, argued um, in his first book that what was happening with the rise in inequality was often that many of the, the, the wealthiest people were actually wage earners, so the labour share data don't tell us the whole picture. Very highly paid people in finance, in, in law too, uh, their incomes are pulling away from everybody else, but they're not just rentiers. But he says right at the top, 0.01%, those people, he said, probably are rentiers. Okay? They're getting their income from shares or from rents of some other sort. So right at the very top, where you see this exponential increase in inequality is associated with returns to capital and not just with returns to labour. So the labour share has been falling everywhere, but it would have fallen further had there not been these very high earners, wage earners right at the top, in finance in particular, they are working long hours and no doubt working very productively at doing what they do, but they're actually um, affecting the overall labour share figure. It would have fallen further had it not been for these very high earners right at the top. So the labour share could be relatively stable, as it is in some countries, but there's still growing inequality within the, um, the if, if you decompose the labour share data. Now, labour share has been going down, and what this means, essentially, is that the uh, return to labour has been falling over time relative to the return to capital. The labour share and the capital share are essentially a unity, so they add up to one. So when the labour share goes down, according to this way of accounting for the functional distribution of income, as it's called, in a capitalist economy, the capital share goes up if the labour share goes down. It's not official measure in some sense, but it's meant to capture relative shares and also relative returns, therefore, and relative costs and prices. As a labour share goes down, labour is becoming cheaper by comparison to capital. So rates of return and shares and the relative cost of labour and the cost of capital are, in this sense, uh, inter inter interrelated. The labour share had been stable in uh, global north economies for a very long period of time but decades, hardly moving, and it was thought to be a constant. Again, Kuznets and others thought this is just what capitalism is, so the labour share is always about 65% of national income. That's obviously not true. We can see it falling over time. It's fallen um, greatly, um, as this chart shows, in US, the USA, Korea, Spain and Italy, and to a lesser extent in some other countries. But it's, it's going down everywhere. Now, what's driving that? Um, these are from Palmer's paper. And um, what, what he suggests is that for the United States, what you see is this very clear divergence between labour productivity, which carries on rising, and wages, which are falling after about 1980 compared to productivity. So productivity, the efficiency of labour, um, the relationship between inputs and outputs, continues to go up over time. So capitalist economy is becoming more productive in this sense over time but Labour's ability to capture part of those rents goes down. So that surplus is going to capital. And this, of course, is the time of the election of Ronald Reagan in the United States. Some specific changes, uh, Palmer argues, laws permitting the uh, return of capital to investors, so-called share buybacks or uh, share repurchases. The company purchases the share capital back from the shareholders is really just a way to distribute uh, earnings more effect effectively than just through a dividend to the shareholders. Previously not allowed. 
So share, buy share buybacks weren't permitted in most countries until about 1980 because they undermined the capital base of the enterprise, or so it was argued. Well, the laws were changed to permit share buybacks, share repurchases, and higher dividends over time. So this is, this is capital claiming a greater part of the rent. It's also worth bearing in mind that male earnings uh, are, are static. Female earnings have been going up in relative terms. So women have been entering the labour market in countries like the United States and Great Britain in particular, where there are quite strong sex equality laws. Um, the position of women relative to men has been improved. And it's not the case at all that full-time, relatively permanent work is declining. It's going up for women in these countries. So there's something of a narrowing of the gap between male and female earnings, but male earnings are static over this period. So there's a loss of any sense here of a male breadwinner model, but I think at the same time, uh, more women are, are breadwinners, yeah. Yeah, these are full-time earners in the United States. That's right. So what, you, what, what, what this is showing is female full-time earnings catching up. And also there are lots of data about number of women employed in full-time work and in stable work increasing over time. It's not the case that the employment contract is dying in the United States, but there has been a recomposition of the, of the gender division, if you like, of access to regular full-time work. Precarious work is not that common in the United States, but equally full-time work is often low-paid and to, to some degree insecure, but America has no unfair dismissal law. So outside the unionized sector, there's a high degree of insecurity, even for full-time, apparently stable jobs. I think there's another hands. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about share buybacks. Are they oh, yeah. more tax efficient than distributing dividends? Sometimes they are, and the companies have a choice in effect of which one to use, and they, they mix them up. But to give you, a, give you an example, okay, a few years ago, um, Apple mm, was targeted by a hedge fund. Now, hedge funds are shareholder activists who won't try to take a company over, but they might buy a small stake and then engage in a campaign to try to pressure the company to do a number of things. They call it returning capital. What they really want is asset sales. Redundancies are often open about this, releasing capital as workers are dismissed and assets are sold higher dividends and or a share buyback. You often see them both mixed up. Now, Apple, perhaps the most successful corporation in the world then and now, a few years ago, was targeted by a very small hedge fund. And they could just have said, we're not interested. And I think if Jobs had been still in charge, it was after he died. The company had new managers, effectively not so much technologists, small people who would manage Apple as a shareholder-owned concern. So the board said, OK, we understand this demand for um, share buybacks, but most of our profits are held overseas. So we can't easily repa repatriate them for tax reasons. So what they then did was extraordinary. They um, issued bonds, form of corporate debt, to the market to raise money to pay the shareholders what would have been like a, sh a share buyback. And it, and it was billions and billions of dollars. It's completely extraordinary that they did that. Now, drawing a link between that and arguments that Apple has become less technologically innovative, it's very hard to do that, to show causation, but arguably that, that was also the case, that the company shifted from being um, more, had been very innovative, very innovative indeed for a while, uh, to being nothing more than really a cash machine for the shareholders. And it's not just Apple. I think there are sectors where you see this very clearly. It's also been argued the quality of service to consumers is declining in quasi-utilities like the airlines. I'm not sure if you tried to check into... Um, Check in at an American airport recently, but it's very difficult these days. It's, it's so ultra automated that almost nobody works um, at the airport, it seems. And maybe the quality of service on these flights is getting worse. Okay, <coughs> this is a global audience, so you've all travelled internationally, right? Don't you think the, the seats are getting smaller and the gap between the. No, but you're much younger than I am, okay? I think this affects people over a certain age. I think okay. I saw something with the yeah. double decker planes now. <laughs> They have double-decker planes. Yeah. They're going to get people to stand at the back and that kind of thing, aren't they? Yeah. But maybe health and safety doesn't permit it. So there is the argument that shareholder pressure is changing the nature of the business model in, in, in many of these mostly US or UK-owned enterprises. So yes, a tax is part of the story. There are tax advantages to it. So they're actively encouraging it. Also remember fiscal subsidies to uh, share options. So executives are paid increasingly in share options, not shares. This is not the same as a, a share, but the option enables you to capture the rise in the share price between 
the point at which the option is first of all awarded and then when it vests and you claim the difference. So executives are being paid in a way that directly links their pay to the shareholder interest. Takeover bids are uh, encouraged or tolerated in order to empower shareholders over managers. Agency theory is a justification for this. Uh, that's right. So there's a whole so kind of political economy going on. So yeah. am I running out of time? No, it's uh, 10 more minutes. I've okay, got 10 more minutes. Right. Yeah. Just Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Well, no, no. What you, what you just said on Shabbat Vax is uh, really striking. I mean, uh, you told her that it was forbidden back then. It was. It yeah. was. It's so forbidden, yeah. Now it's often presented as a DNF, a company, that it's purely yeah. natural, normal to like, buy back its own shares. Yeah. So it's really amazing to think that it was, and for good reasons. Right? It, 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 was it was forbidden. forbidden. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 legal, like yeah, the, the legal theory was that um, if the company just, just returns uh, shares in, in this way, is purchasing a share capital, is using its retained earnings to do so. So the, the company will have retained earnings on its balance sheet. Um, the share capital is, of course, completely different from the uh, retained earnings and uh, productive assets of the firm. So you're whittling down the capital base. And the theory was this was detrimental to the interests of creditors, trade creditors, but also employees. It wasn't so much a corporate governance argument that the shareholders would hollow out the company. That wasn't really the, the logic. Uh, but allowing share buybacks was, was almost the first thing the Reagan administration did. It's quite striking. <laughs> and the justification for that came from, yeah, Chicago School Law and Economics and the idea that the company was there to be run for the shareholders. Milton Friedman, his 1970 article, um, about corporate social responsibility. The responsibility of the corporation is to make profits. The company is owned by the shareholders. The managers work for the shareholders. Jean-Philippe Robet has um, brilliantly denounced this in a number of more recent articles, pointing out that from a legal point of view, the company is not the property of the shareholders. Uh, the company is a separate legal entity from the shareholders. The shareholders own their shares, not the assets. There are so many well, Robet would say basic legal mistakes, actually, in Friedman's famous article. And from there, however, comes the idea that the managers must work for the shareholders. Now, a lawyer would say this is very far from being the reality of the way the company is structured, and it's structured that way for a reason. The shareholders have protection from claims brought by debtors against the corporate assets. They have protection against risk because of the way the company is structured. They can't turn around also and say, we own the company, although they often do make that claim. So this kind of investor-driven capitalism wasn't inevitable and isn't at all built into the structure of company law. It's a more recent innovation. Again, Margaret Blair, a corporate law scholar from the States, argued in the 19th century, it was much more difficult to take capital out of the company and she argued this may have accounted for some of the innovations which were a feature of the 19th century American economy, the railway economy, the second industrial revolution. Okay, so these are, these are the arguments around innovation. Yeah. Now, shareholder law, what's been going on there? Um, labour law hasn't changed all that much. It's not true that labour law has been weakening in many countries. Yes, in the UK it did under Mrs Thatcher. In Reagan's America, but it was never very strong anyway, um, France, Italy, Germany. Okay, so the Macron government has been sceptical about sector-level collective bargaining, but hasn't fundamentally <coughs> deregulated the French labour market the way Mrs Thatcher's government did. In Italy, we see at one moment deregulation and flexibilisation. Actually, that was reversed in recent years, and they reinstated laws to protect full-time workers and also fixed-term employees trying to narrow the gap between those two groups. Reversing segmentation suddenly became the policy in Italy. In the Covid period, um, Germany, Italy, Greece, other European countries uh, passed laws to make it illegal for there to be collective redundancies without state permission. These were laws which used to exist. It used to be necessary to get the permission of the Labour Inspectorate in France to engage in mass dismissals until about 1986. The Chirac government got rid of it. It was sort of brought back, not so much in France, but in Italy in this period. The response to COVID in many countries was to stabilise the employment contract by passing newly protective labour laws. Some of those have been unravelled more recently, but labour law hasn't been going away. Even the sovereign debt crisis didn't lead to a fundamental revision of labour law protections in many countries. However, shareholder law is a different matter. All the way across the EU, uh, largely under the influence of international organisations like the IMF, the World Bank, the OECD and also the US British model, there's been an increase in shareholder rights to do with 
the power of the investors over the board, independent boards being encouraged, independent directors are uh, intended to be more sensitive to the shareholder interest and managers who are insider directors. Takeover bid rules have been liberalised across Europe and indeed in other parts of the world, in South America as well, following the European model, which itself followed the British model, encouraging takeover bids. Now, that hasn't actually led to much of an increase in takeover activity, but what I think you do see is increasing shareholder power within the corporation, and this is associated with, again, more, more use of buybacks, greater use of, um, well, higher, higher dividend payments, and it's a general trend across Europe. So shareholder rights have been getting stronger, while well, labour rights have been flatlining, so in comparative terms, labour is weaker than it was compared to capital. Co-determination versus shareholder protection. Um, we see here um, laws relating to the co-determined board, worker directors, and also works councils, um, works committees within the enterprise, which the employer must consult um, or negotiate with. So we see, what we're seeing here is that the, the co-determined board and the uh, laws relating to the Works Council haven't gone down in this period. They're still very protective across Europe. Um, and in fact, if we took the chart back further, the big period for growth in protections relating to co-determination of both sorts was the 1950s and 1960s. Many countries strengthened their co-determination laws in that period. And uh, a lot of the former socialist bloc countries, like Czechoslovakia, uh, Poland have co-determination laws inherited from the, the socialist or state socialist or communist period, which they never deregulated, they still have them. And in some countries, recently France and recently the Czech Republic, Czechia, there's been a strengthening of co-determination laws at board level. What we also see though are these dramatic changes in protection of shareholders in relation to um, independent boards. Okay, so before about 2000, Virtually no standards mandating independent directors. Then you see a big increase after that. And then you also see the rules on takeover bids becoming consider considerably more shareholder friendly, in large part as a consequence of an EU directive, the 12th Company Law Directive, which did that. So what I think we see is a move from an industrial democracy model based upon co-determination to one in which shareholder rights are um, at least as important. Now, what, what can we um, extrapolate from this about inequality? There has been some e econometric research done. I'll just mention two or three studies. So, Schoberg's paper from 2009 took World Bank data on shareholder protection, not quite what I just showed, but still good data on this particular issue, and correlated that with um, inequality trends. So, her paper suggests that increasing shareholder rights led to a decrease in the labour share and an increase in the capital share which is what we would expect, but she does have some evidence to suggest this was indeed happening. Work I did with um, Zoe Adams and others looked at the relationship between labour protection and the labour share. Now, the labour share has been going down. What we thought was it would have gone down even more had there not been some worker protections in various countries. So the labour share is, it seems, correlated with strong labour protection. Again, what you would expect, but it's useful to have these studies. More interesting, perhaps, okay, very interesting paper by Ferguson et al. Now, what, what they did is they looked at shareholder protection and correlated it with health inequalities, uh, obesity, child mortality. These go up when shareholder rights are strengthened. Now, that's a kind of correlation which we might all ponder on methodologically. What's really being shown here? It's not difficult to get two variables to correlate sometimes in an econometric study. But we have reason to believe that there might be something interesting going on here. Um, increasing inequality is manifested uh, not, not just at the level of income and wealth, but in health inequalities. Highly unequal countries are countries with high rates of child mortality and high rates of obesity. And now that's reason for that's been much discussed, but there is a, a body of work in uh, social psychology and evolutionary psychology which argues that um, we are very much affected at a level of mental health and stress by persistent inequalities. And it's not, it's not good enough to say the rising tide lifts all boats. A very unequal society tends to be one with very high levels of mental stress on all sides. Um, I was reading a, an evolutionary psychology paper where the author argued even the wealthy 
are unhappy in a very unequal society. Now, okay, now you may think that we don't, we don't care too much about the top 0.01%. Actually, maybe he wasn't thinking about the top 0.001%. Okay, but even those people, okay, in their gated communities or living in houses with barbed wire around a garden, okay, you can see this, I'm not mentioning any particular countries, but that's a common um, way of living in many countries, isn't it? Hmm? Maybe even the wealthy are unhappy. Yeah. Yes. So, sorry, I'm running out of, I'm running out of time. Yeah. Now, very briefly as well, there's quite a lot of evidence that inequality is negatively related to productivity as well. Um, and in the paper, you will have seen, I argue that um, so-called capital shallowing, capital um, is relatively expensive compared to labour, so you may have higher employment, but low quality employment in a country like the UK, Capital shallowing, uh, firms have few incentives to invest in new technology if there's lots of cheap labour available to them. It's a bit like going back to Lewis's argument that labour strengthens itself and requires capital to be more productive in the process. This is happening today in the UK. So there are, there are wider implications of the fall of the labour share. And the OECD has looked into this. The, the rise in capital share, bottom line, has not led to more investment. Okay, the, the, the capital released has gone into speculation in... Um, volatile assets, housing and shares. So, um, by way of conclusion, the conclusion is left open. Are we going to see an institutional pushback? Well, I don't know, okay, but um, it's possible that we'll see some sort of double movement. The idea that there would be a Palanian movement back to regulate capitalism, I must admit, was more convincing a year ago when I first gave this presentation than it is now. A year ago, we were coming out of COVID and the strengthening of labour laws. Now, in the UK, we have a neo-Thatcherite government prepared to deregulate everything, but maybe the UK is just one country. Okay, sorry if I've gone on a bit too long, but I'll stop there um, and hopefully... Oh, oh, I'm not sure I should have done that, sorry. Are we still on? I'm okay, okay. No, we can have a discussion. Thanks very much. Yeah.